Hello, and welcome to today's Foreign Policy Virtual Dialogue, a new Cold War, the rise of authoritarianism, and the future of democracy. We're going to discuss the growing threat of authoritarianism in Europe and the world. My name is Rena Nainen, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator this morning. We know the world has seen a steady rise in illiberal democracies, alliances among autocrats, and democratic backsliding in recent years. This has especially been on display in Europe. The war in Ukraine has entered its 10th month on the ground fighting. There are continuing humanitarian violations in Turkey and the threat of nuclear aggression and struggles for domination in the Middle East making authoritarianism a growing threat to Europe and regional security with a broad global implication. So it's against this backdrop, we gathered a group of policymakers and security experts to really help us unpack, unpack these complex issues and explore the question, have we entered a new Cold War era? And we're gonna have a discussion about what this means for the transatlantic alliance, the future of European security architecture and what governments can do to really safeguard democracy. But before I dive in, I wanna extend a very big thanks to the Wilfred Martin Center for European Studies for making this all possible today. And a couple of housekeeping things that I'd love to get into before we start. We really wanna hear from you, our audience. We have hundreds of you tuned in and watching our live stream on social media. We've actually reserved a portion of this event for questions from you our global audience. And here's how you can do that. If you're on Zoom, you just click on that Q&A button and you can submit your questions. Please be sure though to tell us your name, your organization and where you're writing from. And if you're joining us by phone or if you're watching the live stream, you can also email us at this address, events at foreignpolicy.com. Of course, we encourage you to chime in on social media and be sure to use the hashtag safeguard democracy. All right, so let's get right into it. I'm honored to begin our program with Congressman Bill Keating. He's a senior member of the House Foreign Affairs and Armed Forces Committees, and also chairman of the Subcommittee on Europe, Energy, the Environment, and Cyber. Thank you so much for joining us, Congressman Keating. Thank you, Rena. Thank you for uh, having this important discussion right now, probably the most important discussion we can be having globally. It is an important discussion. I wanna get right to it. I wanna ask you, do you believe we've entered a new Cold War era? I think, Rita, that categorizing this and, and compartmentalizing this as a Cold War is limiting. And in fact, it could be dangerous uh, in terms of our ability of dealing with this crisis. It could sidetrack and distract the real issue that's there. And it's limiting because uh, we look at Cold War definitionally as uh, a war that we're used to post-World War II, where uh, they were uh, geopolitical concerns and, and uh, there were great contest between the US and the then Soviet Union. Uh, and they dealt with military issues. They dealt with geopolitical issues. So they were constrained. Uh, that's not the case now, but still, even in the present day, we're limiting the discussion uh, around these kind of geographic boundaries. Even in Congress right now, uh, with the new house majority coming in, the Republicans are gonna have a select committee uh, on China and what's occurring there. While it's an important issue, it, it takes us away from the greater issue. It constrains us from the greater issue of the great threat of author authoritarianism versus democracy that's, a, that's occurring now. And therein lies the danger uh, in doing this. Uh, and I think that uh, we have to look at what's going on now, not as a cold war, uh, but as a multifaceted, multi-front war uh, that's global in nature. And, and deal with the real contest here. It's not, uh, you know, although Ukraine's important, uh, it's important what's going on in the hot war in Ukraine, because that's the point of the spear uh, militarily in terms of Russians aggression. But we have to take the broader picture here and, and realize that uh, the issues we're confronting, the issues that are uh, really the underpinnings of the ability of authoritarianism to supplant democracy around the world uh, are real and our approaches have to be global in nature. We saw it with the pandemic. We saw the fact that that was politicized uh, and, and that was used by authoritarian groups uh, to try and thwart democratic governments, using it as a tool. We see it with climate change, where the refugee issue and the migration issue as a result of climate change is used as a political issue uh, in, in a very narrow sense. We see it with the curtailment of the freedom of the press, uh, 
And importantly, we see it with the threat on the rule of law, the attacks on the judiciary uh, and the introduction of military uh, based governmental uh, responses to this. Uh, and again, uh, within that context, the threat of nuclear war and how uh, we have to look at that at clearly as an authoritarian versus democratic process as well. Uh, it's not a Cold War the way we know it now. Uh, the, you have to look no further than the US. The US itself is in a battle domestically and internally between authoritarianism uh, and democracy. And, and that's clear. Uh, election denial, uh, fake press, uh, issues uh, that deal with undercutting the judiciary in our country. All core democracy issues under threat by uh, authoritarian uh, alternatives. Uh, so you, you can't have a Cold War with yourself. The US cannot have a Cold War with itself. So internally, we have to look at this in the broader context. I want to ask you, Congressman, about that. You know, there have been some concerns about Democratic backsliding following January 6th in the United States. The U.S. for so long has been looked at as a beacon of democracy. Do you believe that the United States still has the clout to help prevent this backsliding around the world? It not only has the clout, it's a necessary partner right now. Uh, some of the greatest discussions I have with our European allies are private ones. And, and during the Trump era, frankly, there was great concern about what was going on in the U.S. Uh, and that, you know, you put that on what's going on in, in Europe right now, the very fragile nature of so many democracies at stake. You can go right through Europe and see the razor thin, uh, you know, hole that democracies are clinging on to and, and the threats that are there. They needed the U.S. and they told me this. Uh, they welcome the U.S. back in this present administration, but there remains a great deal of concern and skepticism that there will be a fallback from the United States. So the United States is necessary. It is indeed the beacon. However, we can't do it alone either. Uh, and we have to begin with our European allies uh, because we share so many common values and strengths. They can't do it alone there. We can't do it alone here. So together, we have to deal, this, deal with this issue. And that's what's important. And that's what we saw coming around Ukraine uh, as a, a very important effect of Putin's aggression. You saw the NATO allies come together, but you saw the expanded European countries coming together. You saw countries like Sweden, who've been neutral their whole lives, and Finland coming together. But it's just not a military issue. And that's the importance of understanding the threat to democracy from authoritarianism right now. Where do you think the best opportunity for action that could be most constructive and you can see a tangible difference on the ground with the United States and their partners in helping solidify democracies around the world? I think when you look to China and what they're doing economically, we have to understand that that is a necessary component. We have to build up uh, our norms and our values around our economic institutions. And that means uh, standardizing economic activities, having greater trade among uh, dem democratic countries and being able to do that because China is using their authoritarianism and say, saying to so many countries and so many leaders uh, that you can't wait for democracy to take hold. It's too slow. It's too inefficient. We have, a, we have an alternative way of dealing with it. And that's very attractive to many emerging countries and countries where uh, their own uh, leadership is not as democratic as it should be. So what we have to do is have a response. I can't tell you in Africa how many times talking to leaders there, they're saying, we would like to be with you, but you're not there. And we not only have to be there uh, as the US, we have to be there with our allies and even beyond uh, Europe and the US, having countries like Japan and other countries coming in and join us. So fortifying the rule of law, human rights, economic ties, those are the cores. Those are the front lines to the fight right now uh, uh, to save democracy. I want to turn a little bit to the hot war in Ukraine, as you mentioned in the beginning. We know, obviously, the U.S. has supplied military aid, but some are saying that our efforts aren't enough to help Ukraine win that war. Is that fair criticism? What do you believe are the responsibilities of the United States, especially as we enter into the new year? Well, to be successful, the first responsibility is to keep our alliance together. People don't put enough emphasis on that. I think the people viewing this today understand uh, when you look at Europe, uh, there's a European Union, of course, there's NATO, but it's just not one uh, great country. It's made up of all 
you know, over 27 uh, Eve, you know, uh, sovereign nations. And our ability and our lead- the leadership of the U.S. to put that group together has been essential. So that's the foundation that we go forward. Then you can deal with the military issues th- that are there, how we have made promises to backfill some of our allies when they were moving military assets into the area, how the U.S. has moved forward itself, how we've shared intelligence has been critical and, and unprecedented, uh, I think, in U.S. history, where we've taken very exquisite intelligence and shared that with our allies and then shared it more openly to thwart what Putin has been doing. So. Uh, On all those fronts, it's important. Uh, I think that in terms of the military response, uh, it's been extraordinary if you look at uh, where we started from. Uh, And there's uh, there's other issues that I I won't get into, some of them classified, that uh, inhibit our ability all at once to to give the assets that maybe that the President Zelensky has been asking for at the time he's been asking for. And quietly behind the scenes, uh, we are meeting almost all of those demands. Now, there's there's military issues that uh, still have to be fortified, and that includes air defense in particular. Uh, but we're moving in that direction. Countries that in Europe, uh, Germany is a great example, that have never moved in the direction they're moving now are moving now. Uh, so our ability to keep everyone together uh, is uh, job number one. Uh, and without that, all the military aid and everything else that would follow uh, wouldn't be sufficient. On that thought of trying to keep everyone together, there's been some criticism that NATO and the UN are really not up to the task of handling these issues that the world is currently facing. Do you believe that we need to rethink these alliances and these institutions? No, I think we have to fortify those alliances and then augment them uh, with soft power, augment them with economic uh, uh, you know, cohesion uh, that shares uh, the, our values in dealing with the way workers are treated, uh, the working conditions, environmental issues, safety issues, all those things, uh, the guarding of intellectual property. Uh, the UN uh, presents a problem with Russia in particular because of their position on the Security Council and, and how they can thwart things there and how China can join them in that respect. Yet uh, the, US is in, the UN is important uh, in so many facets. Uh, look at their issues and they're dealing with the IEU surrounding the nuclear plant in Ukraine. Uh, It's important to have their voice there. It's important to have uh, people on the ground. Uh, And at a later stage, as we move towards a solution, uh, the UN will have a greater role. As we wrap up in in these final few moments, um, I'd love to get your thoughts on where you believe constructively the United States can zero in in really fortifying democracies around the world. Well, I think importantly, it's important what we do here at home. The world is watching. Uh, the video of January 6th went worldwide and continues to be uh, you know, worldwide. When democracy by its very nature, our free speech, free press, uh, there's, a, there's not a level playing field with authoritarian countries who try to censor this, uh, but that's our strength in the long run. Uh, so we have to look at ourselves first and make sure in terms of human rights, we're clear as a country. In terms of climate change, we're clear as a country. In terms of uh, economic development and how that should be conducted, that we're clear. And we have to make sure we're setting the right example uh, worldwide when it comes to uh, dealing with and speaking out against election deniers, against people that disparage the press, uh, about the growing violence that that occurs. So uh, to me, it starts at home. Uh, People are watching. Uh, and people need us as that necessary, indispensable partner uh, of democracy. Uh, that combined with the realization here in our home country that we can't do this by ourselves are, are the key pivotal points that we go forward with. And, and that's why it's not a Cold War in, in the traditional sense. It's not narrow. It's not constrained or compartmentalized. Uh, we're fighting a very different war right now. Uh, and it's an extension, it's an existential one. Uh, and, and so I hope that that perspective is there. So we're not just talking about how we deal with the war uh, that what Russia has waged uh, on Ukraine, just in military uh, parameters. We have to look at it in the broader sense, what it means to democracy uh, globally. And, and, and that's important to keep focusing on. Uh, we have to make sure people in the US, the people in Europe, people that are engaged in this, uh, 
uh, people that are working hard for democratic values and ideals understand they have a, sta a stake in this war themselves. It's just not uh, a war uh, on the grounds uh, of Ukrainian soil. I hear you saying that um, you've got to make people believe that they have a stake in this, but it so, can be so depressing when you see the rise of authoritarian regimes around the world and how susceptible many countries, especially in this economic environment, are to falling. What gives you the most hope that they can be countered and that democracy can prevail around the world? You know, I, 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 people look to Hungary and, and what's been happening there, um, and they look at the relationship that was uh, brewing uh, with Poland when one of the effects of Putin's aggression in, in Ukraine was Poland shifted uh, away from that uh, a great deal and, and understands that. Uh, but looking at it globally, what gives me the greatest hope, uh, people want to have a say in their government. They want their own freedoms. Uh, and you see the protests that are occurring around the world right now. You see what's happening in Iran. Uh, you see what happened in China. Uh, you see in, in Ukraine, dating back from recently to the, the, to the Madan and how people risk their lives coming uh, to the square, coming forward, protesting. Uh, how journalists are speaking the truth, uh, even though we've had more journalists killed this year uh, than in, in previous years. It's the courage and it's the human desire to be free, to self-govern, to, to be able to have a life uh, where they can bring themselves and their families forward with an education, sharing the values that, that bring them forward. So that's what's at stake. That's what gives me the greatest hope. When you talk to people, when you deal with people, if I could have a second, when I went to... Uh, uh, visit in Helmut province uh, during the Afghanistan war. There was someone, uh, a local person there that was helping risking their lives. The Marines asked me just to thank this person so they could see that, thanks. And I said, why are you risking your life? That person is likely dead now. Why are you risking your life providing the information to help us uh, in this war? And behind him, he brought out his eight year old son. And he said, because I want my son to have a chance for education. I want my son to have a chance in, in this world going forward, uh, a, a free chance, a fair chance. And that gives me the most hope. What a powerful story. That story says so very much. Congressman Keating, I wanna thank you so much for your insights and, and for sharing your thoughts in this moment right now. Thank you, Rena. You bet. Well, for our next conversation, we wanna take a closer look at Europe and global security. I'm pleased to welcome our panelist, Michael Abramowitz, president of the Freedom House, Timothy Gardnash, historian and professor of European studies at the University of Oxford. He also has a new book out, Homelands, A Personal History of Europe. It'll actually be out this spring, so be sure to check that out. And Dr. Alina Polyakova, who's president and CEO of the Center for European Policy. Dr. Alina, I'd love to start it off with you. You know, um, we just asked the congressman, are we entering a new Cold War? What are your thoughts? Well, thank you so much for the question, Rena. And I listened to Congressman Keating with a lot of interest. Uh, I have to say, I agree with a lot of the points he made. I don't think uh, we are in a new Cold War at all. In fact, I think the situation is far, far worse um, than it was during the Soviet era uh, for some of the reasons the congressman mentioned, but really for, I think, two specific reasons. One, uh, the entire nuclear deterrence, nuclear arms architecture that we built at the end of the Cold War of the Soviet Union has completely fallen apart. You know, we no longer have agreement between Russia and the United States, which are together hold the vast majority of nuclear weapons in, in, in the world. Uh, but all the treaties governing that, for example, the Intermediate uh, Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF, uh, the ABM, we have basically just one treaty left that may or may not be renewed um, in the next several years. So that's a really dangerous situation we find ourselves in. Plus, many other countries now possess uh, nuclear capabilities in the way they did during the Cold War. And I think the second reason why we're in a far more dangerous situation is because this is a multi-vector challenge to democratic governments at large. You know, we have interference, massive interference in democratic elections not just in the United States, but across Europe, almost every electoral cycle this has become now part of the norm versus an outlier. Um, so we are in a hybrid war, really, 
uh, where we see information tactics, influence operations, cyber attacks, all of these kinds of new technologies being deployed by authoritarian states in a way that, of course, they didn't exist um, not in, in the not too distant past. Mm. Mike, I'd love to turn to you, you know, as we've heard Dr. Lena sort of mention and, and map out where we're at right now and her thoughts. You know, we've seen these authoritarian governments sort of reach beyond their borders. I'm curious, what are some of the hot spots that you're watching right now? Well, thanks for having me, Rena. And I certainly would agree with Alina that I don't think we're in a new Cold War, but the situate, but the global situation is much more complicated in some ways. And countries like Russia and China have many more uh, tools uh, to exercise uh, power than perhaps uh, the Soviet Union did, you know, 50 years ago. And I think in particular of their ability to reach beyond their borders and to kind of exploit the openness of democratic societies in a number of different ways. Uh, we've mentioned election interference, disinformation campaigns. We just did a big report at Freedom House about the global influence of China in trying to shape the media environment uh, all over the world. I think the one particular area that we are, we've been quite, quite concerned about at Freedom House is the practice of what we call transnational repression, where you think about the murder of Jamal Khashoggi in a Turkish uh, consulate by the Saudi regime. We are seeing countries like Saudi Arabia, Russia, uh, uh, Iran, uh, China, who are really reaching beyond their borders uh, to target and uh, in some cases kill, but in other cases intimidate their critics abroad. And so we really have seen a globalization, if you will, of the authoritarian approach. A globalization of the authoritarian approach. Tim, I wanna to turn to you and ask you, what do you think these trends that we're seeing means for the Transatlantic Alliance? Um, can I start by just saying a word about Ukraine? Because I literally just got back from Ukraine this weekend, yeah. talking to terrible stories, refugees from Mariupol, Kramatorsk, uh, an amazing soldier who'd been wounded twice, but was going back again to the battlefield near Kherson. And, you know, the best thing we can do in terms of this global competition between democracy and authoritarianism is to help Ukraine win the hot war, which means more weapons, more air defenses, more tanks. Um, that said, I think um, there is a, um, a similarity and a difference with the Cold War. Um, the difference, as everyone has said, is it's not bipolar, it's multipolar. And so we have to find the arguments that play with powers like India, Brazil, and South Africa, you know, which in the Ukraine war have more or less lined up with Russia, certainly not with the West. The great similarity is that and, and I spent much of my life writing about the history of the Cold War, um, the, the biggest thing we did in the entire history of the Cold War to win the Cold War was to keep our own democracies strong, prosperous, dynamic, and attractive. And that's where we're falling down both sides of the Atlantic. Hungary is no longer a democracy. Far too long, by the way, um, tolerated by, by the EPP, by the Democratic Center right, since this event is sponsored by the Wilfrid Martin Center, that's worth saying. So I think on both sides of the Atlantic, the first thing we have to do is to get our own democracies back into good shape. And then clearly it needs a stronger partnership, more in Europe being done for our own defense, because the United States obviously has to worry a great deal about China at the same time as Russia. I wanna to turn to Alina as well to ask you, Alina, about when you were looking sort of at conventional weapons, a Cold War at that time period, that was such a big focus. But now when you're looking at this war, disinformation is something you've gotta keep in mind. There are other influence tactics that are being used. When you think about this, what do you believe really works in countering uh, the threat effectively that we're facing right now? And I'm wondering if you can also, I know um, you, also speak a lot about Chinese investment in the global South. Can you talk to a little bit about that as well? Sure, that's, that's a lot to cover, Rina, but I'll do my best. You know, just to follow up on, on Timothy's uh, great points, um, I very much see Ukraine as a test case for the future of US global leadership and for the future of democratic governance. I mean, there's no, uh, it's not an accident that we see a full scale invasion of a country that has democratic aspirations to be part of the Euro-Atlantic community to be a democratic uh, Western facing country. And we've seen authoritarian state 
Russia, led by Vladimir Putin, now through military means, trying to prevent that country from going in that direction. I think if we don't respond here, this will be a lesson learned for Beijing and for other authoritarian states across the world. And, and of course, this war has been multivectored, as you mentioned. Um, issues around disinformation have been with us now for a very long time. I will say it's been a very, very frustrating area to work in because we haven't solved the problem at all. And I will tell you in 2015, uh, when I was working on these issues and center, the Center for European Analysis uh, was the the first organization to highlight these issues in a large conference that we held. And I can tell you very few people cared. Very few people understood this to be a threat just seven years ago. And unfortunately now, well, we know a lot more about information influence operations, especially in vulnerable countries that you mentioned like the global South, where both Russia and China have been so effective at spreading their own vision of the world in their starting their own narrative because we have left a vacuum there, because we have been absent and we haven't understood how critical it is for us to have a narrative, which we did during the Cold War. Another big difference is that we completely dismantled you know, our ability to message to these vulnerable states, to these states behind the so-called Iron Curtain at the time. And we just don't have those capabilities. You look at how much the U.S. invests in RFERL, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and Voice of America compared to how much Beijing or even Moscow invests in their propaganda arms, um, it is night and day. You know, We should be the beacon of democracy, not just in perspective of having our own house in order, but being able to deliver truthful information um, to these countries that don't have access to that information. So I'm afraid that we're very much losing the war over narratives in countries in Africa even in Europe, in the Balkans, for example, we just had uh, we just had a huge workshop um, in Belgrade uh, at SIPA where we brought together experts from all over Europe on China. And the bottom line there was very terrifying because there was mass agreement that the West has lost the Balkans. And these are countries in the heart of Europe. So I think we just have a huge amount of work to do um, to start to really, really come back and build these partnerships in the global south, but as well as you know, in the center of our global alliances. It's fascinating to hear you say that there's a sense that the Balkans have been lost. Mike, I want to turn to you. We heard earlier uh, Congressman Keating mention about how even domestically in the US, it's a battle for authoritarianism versus democracy. How do we strengthen democracy at home within our own communities and, and also still be a beacon to strengthen other institutions around the world and defend human rights globally. You know, President Trump had pulled out of the Human Rights Commission in the UN. How do we do this? Well, first of all, I think you have to do both. It's not a choice. It's not a binary choice between uh, trying to protect your own democracy and trying to promote and protect democracy overseas. I think that one point I just would like to say to add to the very good comments by my colleagues on this panel is I do think that the United States, to some extent, is suffering a very long hangover from the Iraq war. And that, I think, uh, in my conversations with our partners and with uh, colleagues around the world, I think that is still something that is thrown back in the face of the United States, whether fairly or not fairly. And I think that that is something uh, that I think the current administration is 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 dealing with it by showing rather than telling in the in the way they've approached uh, the Ukraine war, uh, in which they have basically tried to rally uh, the world community, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, to the defense of Ukraine. I think they've done a reasonably good job at that. We'll see how long that lasts, given the uh, the coming winter and uh, the natural disinclination of countries to want to keep going to support a war that may last for qu quite some time. But I very much agree with the points that have been made that Ukraine is the front line of the battle for democracy. I think on the US, I would just say this. Uh, at Freedom House, we've long recognized that there's a deep connection between the health of US democracy and, and global democracy. Uh, I think that if the United States is weak, if the United States is dysfunctional, I think if the United States is mired in gridlock, that is basically a key propaganda point for uh, the, our geopolitical rivals and for and for and for authoritarian countries. I don't think there's a magic bullet. 
Uh, I think there are a lot of great ideas out there in terms of how to strengthen U.S. democracy, uh, rank choice voting, you know, trying to limit the uh, influence of money in politics, making voting easier. You know, there are dozens of great ideas. The question is, we don't seem to have the will as a country to try to work across the aisle to try to uh, to, to enact those uh, reforms. So I think, you know, really, in some ways, the most important thing for the health of U.S. democracy is to break that gridlock and to show that we can work as a country across the political aisle to achieve common things, whether for democracy or in terms of economics or immigration or whatever. Uh, thank you, Mike. Tim, I want to sort of stand back and look around at Europe. When you're looking at the trends that we've been talking about in this hour, what do you think it means for the future of European security architecture? Well, first of all, to pick up Alina's point about the Balkans, one of the main reasons the Balkans are so disillusioned with the West is that EU enlargement has stalled for the last 15 years. And I think this one is very much on us in Europe. And oddly enough, the Ukraine war gives an opportunity to bring new dynamism to the process of EU enlargement. Chancellor Scholz has now committed to EU enlargement, both for the Western Balkans and for Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. And for me, that's the, a crucial part of, of a, a transatlantic strategy, but specifically a European strategy uh, going forward, starting with making EU enlargement a reality, a real prospect, uh, for the Balkans and 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 then indeed for Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, and I think that would be a major contribution to to the transatlantic um, partnership. Can I say just one other word about um, the swing states, the non-Western democracies, the Indias, South Africa's, Brazil? I think there's a huge question for us, which is how do we craft narratives that really have traction with these post-colonial countries, and I'm, I'm not persuaded that actually talking about human rights and democracy and multilateralism and rule of law is necessarily the most effective argument with them. I would say we need to look at a couple of other Western values. Number one, sovereignty. After all, what is the war in Ukraine but the defense of sovereignty? Sovereignty is a great value for post-colonial countries. We in the West have neglected talking about sovereignty for too long. The other is, this is a nuance, but I think it's an important nuance. Maybe we need to talk a bit more about freedom rather than more specifically democracy. After all, Mike's organization is called Freedom House. You know, when you see the demonstrators in China or on the streets of Iran or, or people in Ukraine, that's the first word on their lips, freedom. So craft our narratives of sovereignty and freedom so they really have more traction with the swing states in the wider world. Tim, thank you. Uh, Mike, I, I wanna ask you a little bit about NATO and also about the UN. You know, there's been some criticism. Have they done enough? Um, you know, Sweden wants to, to enter and be part of NATO as well. Do you think these alliances need to be rethought? Well, first of all, I just, if I may, I just wanna pick up on Timothy's really good point about freedom. And I just wanna introduce a point of maybe optimism to the discussion. I think there's a lot of challenges we have, but I personally have, am pretty, I wouldn't say, you know, unrealistically optimistic, but I feel like there is, you know, some very good things that are happening right now. One of which is the, uh, the incredible outpouring of street protests in Iran. Not sure where that's gonna go, but that to me is a very, you know, interesting and important development. We have the situation in Ukraine we've discussed today where the Ukrainian government, against really all predictions in, uh, outside have, have held their own are now in the process of, I think, winning that war. And I think also in the United States, I think the, the midterm elections were, a, I, don't, I don't say this from a partisan point of view because we're a strictly nonpartisan organization, but the fact that those uh, candidates who were, quote unquote, you know, anti-democratic in the small d sense of the word, I think did not do very well. So I think we're, we're in a period of, uh, of uh, where I think might be a little bit more hopeful than I was a year ago. We're not out of the woods at all by any chance, but I think we have to guard against undue pessimism of all of this. I do think on your question about NATO and institutions, it's clear that the authoritarian countries have done a very good job of exploiting uh, these institutions for their benefit. Uh, I think, you know, a great example is the UN Human Rights Council, where I think at last count, maybe a third of the members were countries that were considered unfree by Freedom House. Now that's 
you know, ridiculous. I don't think the answer is to withdraw from those institutions. Uh, it's going to be, but I do think the answer is for, for the United States and other democracies to get in there and fight more effectively uh, on the behalf of, 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 of shared values. China is doing that. Uh, they have a huge international effort to influence the these international institutions, and I think democracies have to fight back. Mike, back to the your the your um, point about Iran. How do you think the global community can best support pro democracy supporters inside Iran? Well, I think that's a great question. I, I, the true answer, I'm not a hundred percent certain. I think it's important for that battle for 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 outside forces to be supportive, to be open in our uh, clarity of the, 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 that the regime is illegitimate, but, but, but we have to be careful. The, 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 it's the people of Iran who are gonna be making the choices uh, and, uh, and this cannot be uh, uh, instrumentalized by the regime as something that the, uh, that, the, uh, uh, that the West wants. It's something that the people of Iran want. The people of Iran are basically saying that this is an illegitimate uh, regime and we want a different one. And that's a very powerful message. It strikes me that our, our, our job is to be supportive of that and to try to uh, uh, and and to try to in international form, which I think we are. There's going to be a vote this week at the United at the United Nations about trying to boot uh, Iran off the Commission on Women. I think that's a important another important sign. There is a uh, so I, I think it's important for us to be clear that we are supportive, but that it's the people of Iran uh, who are going to control their own destiny. Alina, I want to ask you, we talked a little bit about Iran, but I want to also ask you about China, Taiwan in particular. Um, we've talked about the hot war in uh, the hot war in Ukraine, but what about the potential of a hot war in Taiwan? Well, one thing I will say is that we have to separate NATO from the UN. Uh, we have to be really clear about what these institutions, multilateral institutions, were founded to do. Um, and I will get to your point in the Indo-Pacific, which is, I think, very much connected to what's happening in Ukraine, of course. I think there's a tendency to see these conflicts or the potential conflict in Taiwan as separate, completely separate from what's happening um, in Ukraine, but they are absolutely interconnected. And one thing we've learned from the war in Ukraine um, is that one, non-alliance, non-membership, is not an option. Why do Finland and Sweden, after hundreds of years of neutrality, want to join NATO? Because they've realized that if you're not part of the alliance, then you are prey. There's a reason why uh, Ukraine was attacked by, by Moscow, but not Lithuania or Estonia or Latvia. Um, I, I can almost guarantee you that those countries have not been uh, allowed to join NATO through NATO's open door policy that they would have Russian troops in these countries, if not now, then in, in the near future. Um, so there's a all non-alignment is no longer an option from a defense and security perspective. And I think NATO has proven itself to be an incredibly effective uh, defense organization that has been reinvigorated uh, because of Russia's attacks in Ukraine. Now we don't have a NATO for the Indo-Pacific, but we do have a complex system in the United States of alliance structures, of course. And we also have commitments, uh, security commitments to Taiwan. I think the, we know that in Beijing, US actions are being watched very, very closely in regards to Ukraine and being agonizingly scrutinized and analyzed by military planners and political leaders and decision makers in China. And what that means for us is of course, that if there is a two front war, um, the US, is not well prepared to be able to fight two fronts. Now, we just had the national defense strategy come out, of course, in which the US has defined Russia as a so-called acute threat, which no one truly knows what that means, to be honest with you. Um, and then we've defined uh, uh, China as the so-called pacing threat, the global long-term challenge for the US. But we are already thinking about the next potential hypothetical war in Taiwan, where we haven't yet found a solution to what's happening today. I think this is the real problem because everything that's happening in Ukraine is having global effects and it will affect the future of the US standing in the world and the US role in the world. But we're already moving on in Washington into thinking more about the Indo-Pacific. And I think that to my mind is, is the real problem here. But I think we need more, what we've learned is that we need these very coherent, very committed alliance systems to be able to defend anywhere in the world like NATO.
uh, that is the big lesson to me from what's happening in Ukraine for Taiwan. Alina, I've got a question for you about Africa. This comes from Mohammed Abdella asking, where does Africa stand in this struggle? And what do you expect from the Africa-US summit? Are we neglecting Africa? I absolutely do think for far too long um, because of the U.S. foreign policy focus on the global war on terror, uh, because of our focus on the Indo-Pacific, we tried to pivot to China, so to say, many, many years ago to the Obama administration. So this has been long in the making. You know, the U.S. Uh, looking towards the future threat that is China and the Indo-Pacific, and as a result, neglecting our partnership across the world. And in those years, well, guess who has been active, of course? Um, it's been China with economic investment across the, the global south and, and specifically in um, some specific uh, African countries as well. Um, and it has been Russia that's been spreading narratives and shaping people's view of the world about the United States and so-called U.S. hegemony and U.S. colonialism. I mean, these are the kinds of narratives you hear from the Russian side. So, yes, today we have a uh, you know, very important uh, event, which is the African Leaders Summit here in Washington. Um, I hope that this will be one of many steps the administration has been very focused on re-engaging with partners um, in Africa, but we need to do a lot more. And I will say that we can, do, we can do very little compared to what we do elsewhere and get a lot out of it. I think uh, it was uh, Congressman Keating that made the point is that these countries want to work with us. They mm -hmm. want to live in free societies, but we're not there. Mm -hmm. So I hope that, that one of the outcomes of the summit uh, will be to be a first step towards building those relationships again. Uh, thank you very much. I wanna to turn to Tim. Tim, we've got a question here from Panos uh, Sasiopoulos. I hope I pronounced your name right there. Um, it says, you mentioned China, Russia, and Iran as threats to the West. What about Turkey? Is it part of the West, but at the same time acts as a bully to its neighbors, undermines the unity of NATO by adding obstacles to Finland and Sweden's ascension to it, and threatens openly and repeatedly with an invasion uh, another of another NATO member, Greece? Tim. Indeed, that's a very interesting question. And if, if I may say so, it sounds like a Greek question. Um, we're moving into a world of, of, of great powers who are pursuing their own interests um, quite cynically and ruthlessly and uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan's Turkey, which is of course a, a hard, harsh authoritarian regime, is quite cleverly playing both sides. It's a member of NATO. Uh, it's um, been very helpful in the uh, grain export deal from Ukraine, but simultaneously, it's keeping in well with Russia and actually um, has a developing economic relationship with Russia. And that is simply the future that we face. Um, players, even in our own alliances, um, so Hungary would be another example, who are playing both sides. And I think the task for us is to set limits to the ability of of, of powers in a given alliance or given community um, to, to, to play both sides like that. Mike, I wanna ask you a little bit, um, I know Tim just sort of hit on the, the global perspective here, but when you look at America, America can't be everywhere. So what are the investments that the United States can make that could revitalize democracies and, and help uh, countries that might be on the verge? I think that's a great question and I would just, I think, you know, there's been a lot of talk in Washington about a about a greater, you know, pro democracy strategy. What does that consist of? We haven't really seen that global strategy from the Biden administration, although we've seen, you know, strong uh, words and rhetoric. I think you have. To, I think I would break it down to some specific things, and I would say three or four things. I think fighting corruption is a should be a key part of the global strategy. If you look around, you know, one of the things that is similar to between many of the countries that are faltering is the presence of, you know, the looting of state resources, uh, you know, the parking of those assets in, in the Western financial system. And I think you're starting to see from the Biden administration, you know, some effort to, 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 uh, to address that. I think number two uh, is uh, supporting the independent media. I think absolutely critical to uh, democracy is the presence of a, of a free and independent press. Uh, that uh, holds the powerful to account and that uh, ex uh, ex uh, uh, informs the, the populace with, with facts. And I think that is under a great deal of global stress. 
Uh, I think uh, I totally agree with the point that was made earlier by Alina about greater support for things like uh, Radio Free Europe and Voice of America. But I also think it's about looking for innovative ways to support uh, the presence of reporters on the ground around the world. And I do think uh, the third thing I would just mention is not the these are not the only three. There could be others. But I think, you know, figuring out greater support for online activists around the world. And I think the point you asked about Iran is a good one. It's very challenging for activists uh, right now who are working in places like Myanmar, Russia, uh, Iran, uh, Belarus. Uh, there's a great deal of uh, threat to them. Uh, how do we support them in their work? How do we support them in ex exile when they when they leave their country and try to continue their work in other countries? I think this is another area of that I think the United States and other democracies need to get more creative and innovative about. I want to allow you guys to have some final thoughts, and I'd love to do sort of a, a whip around to um, get your thoughts on what you are watching in the coming months, especially um, with the rise of authoritarian regimes and trying to fortify democracies around the world, and what your prescription might be for that. Uh, I'd love to start maybe Alina, go to Tim, and, and let Mike have the last word. Um, sure. Uh, this is the, the the difficult question because everything we've discussed, of course, has been so wide ranging. You know, I think one of the effective things that we've seen from a solution side on the counter disinformation front has been the ability of the United States to really publicly message in a very effective way, meaning from official channels. Um, on, for example, uh, when the war was about to break out um, in Ukraine, I thought that the U.S declassifying intelligence, sharing that with allies, and then speaking to that very, very publicly from the highest levels of power from the Secretary of State to the President himself was incredibly effective. I think this is a lesson learned that we do have the clout, as you said earlier, Rina, to be able to set the narrative, to be able to set the agenda. We just need to uh, be much more assertive about our, our desire to do that. I mean, it really just takes will. So that we might, I think that's been something that's been very effective that we can see as, as a good example of how we can counter some of these threats. And, and of course, the, the second issue that I would raise that I do think would be very effective is, of course, for the U.S. to be far, far more involved in building economic relations, especially in the tech sector. Uh, we are the global power when it comes to technology. Uh, we haven't talked about this on this panel, but that is, to my mind, the arena where a lot of this global competition between authoritarianism and the free world, if we want to call it that, is playing out. It is playing out in competition over semiconductors, AI, autonomous computing, quantum computing, all of these various technological innovative trends that we see in our society. And the only way that we're going to keep our competitive edge is if we build relationships for, um, across the globe to be able to maintain a technological um, advantage over countries like China. I'm not, I won't mention Russia because they're not really in this game, but China certainly is and has already outranked um, the United States in many, many technological arenas. So those are the two areas I would highlight. It's fascinating, Alina, to hear you talk about tech and how that could be wielded as a significant um, motivator to get people to, to foster democracies and, and support that. Thank you very much. Tim, I'd love to have you weigh in. Three points. First of all, what we started after the end of the Cold War was the enlargement of the West. And that was crucially about two key institutions, NATO and the EU. And it was exactly the right thing to do, as Alina said earlier. And we need to keep going with that. The Western Balkans, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova. Um, and that in itself will be a great contribution to the wider strength and security of the West. Second point, that will also contribute in the long term to changing Russia. The best thing that could happen to Russia long term is for that country to lose the war in Ukraine. The best thing that happened to Germany in 1945 was that it lost the war. And when we see people with the extraordinary courage of Alexei Navalny and those who support him, we have always to remember that there are quite a lot of people still in Russia, now utterly silenced, or, or most of them outside the country, who really do share our values, who do want a democratic and free Russia. And we have to keep talking to them and not just to Putin and the regime. And that brings me to the final point, which is we really have to get much smarter in the stories we tell 
and how we tell them to the rest of the world. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I, I, Radio Free Europe is an important part of my life. It did a fantastic job. But frankly, today, it's not going to be Radio Free Europe. It's going to be something in social media or online or some other kind of mix of mediums. We have to listen to people in the countries themselves. I would say do a lot more listening, not just speaking. Hear how they see us, what arguments actually appeal to people in India or South Africa or Brazil, and how we get those um, those, uh, those arguments across. Um, we can't let the devil have all the best tunes. <laughs> That's fascinating. Uh, Tim, and what a great point. You've made that twice in this panel, the power of storytelling and how important that is. Thank you so much. And Mike, I'd love to have you uh, have the final word. Well, you asked, Rena, what is what are we looking at? I think Iran is really a fascinating situation. And I think we have to uh, have some imagination of what could happen. I, It's very, I mean, most people are going to predict that the regime will have a brutal crackdown, uh, you know, perhaps the way China did in Tiananmen Square many years ago, or the way that Assad uh, had a crackdown in Syria. And that may well be what happens, but these regimes are brittle. Uh, we have to, you know, we are seeing by the, really by the actions of the Ukraine people, by the actions of the uh, Iranian people, even in China, uh, the protests uh, that have taken place over the last several weeks are fascinating and heartening. People, uh, you know, the natural instinct of the human heart, as I think John McCain once said, is for freedom. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, you know, it, it's, it's, I think it's important for policymakers uh, in the West to have uh, a bit more imagination about what can be done to support this universal aspiration. Mm -hmm. So true, so true, Mike, the power of imagination and the need for that in the policy world uh, and the think tank world and among governments. I wanna thank all of you very much, Alina, Tim and Mike, thank you for your perspective and, and for that deep dive into uh, a bunch of issues that really can be so transformative as we're looking at the big picture. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And our next conversation to sort of give us some reflection on the discussion we've had today. I'm delighted to introduce Hami Huthanen, who's executive director of the Martin Center, who's sponsoring this event, this virtual dialogue. We wanna thank you very much, Tommy. Welcome uh, our thank panelists you. today and the Congressman, so much to chew on, but what's really resonated and, and stood out to you from what you've heard today? Thank you, Rena, and so great pleasure to be with, uh, with you. Um, I guess my task is kind of wrap up the main points of the discussion and maybe add some, uh, add some um, I don't know, new, new elements. First of all, I guess we could say that uh, I think we all in the panel agreed that uh, it's uh, the period of end of history is over. I guess in certain way we are back in a, yeah, in a period of return of history uh, in one way. So it's not back to Cold War, but it's something much more complex. I think it was Timothy who made the point that that from uh, you know, unipolar system we are making, going now to multipolar system. So we see, see actors, we see US, we see uh, Europe, European Union, China, but potentially in the future, uh, uh, maybe India, maybe the African states. And the point here is that, that uh, many actors outside of, uh, of West are, are, are saying that, hey, it's not really about democracy versus authoritarianism, but it's about West against the rest. And so it's a geopolitical question. I think we need to take that to, uh, that to account. Uh, one point, if you look at global developments, and I think it was mentioned, especially about, uh, about uh, development in China and Russia, the old argument with Churchill Winston made that, you know, the democracy is not maybe the best system, but it's uh, sure is, uh, or it's not the most functional system, but it's for sure the best we have. I think if you look how China is banging its head on COVID policy, it's COVID policy or Russia, with uh, with its war in Ukraine, we uh, see that they don't. These systems do not have the strength of the auto correction, which uh, the democracies do have. But as it was mentioned in the panel, we have internal challenges. Of many of mentioned the sixth of January events in the uh, United States. Um, 
uh, internal challenges, challenges in Europe, they mentioned, okay, Timothy, you mentioned Fides about EPP. I have to respond to you that, first of all, Fides is out from EPP for two years. Secondly, now the EPP-led commission is very hard on Hungary. 7.5 billion uh, euros have been freezed. And thirdly, the argument always in the EPP was that we keep the Fides in also in order then to be even more radical. And you can make that argument that last two years have been, they have been becoming much more extreme. But back to the, back to the story, war in Russia, no, war in Ukraine was mentioned. And, uh, and I think the point there is very clear. I think that still in Europe, we don't have a full understanding on the profound implications on, on what, what will be the consequences if, if Putin will somehow manage to muddle through and remain in power. And that's the challenge we have in Europe. So to conclude, democracy is in need to be defended, but how? First of all, I think it was pointed out by many of you, you know, if we want democracy to be success, we also we need to be sure that the, our societies, democratic societies are success. Because for us, it's a more value-based issue, but for actor, global actors, they're looking the best surviving system and, and there the results do matter. It was mentioned also uh, mentioned that that the current context of uh, democracy, how democracy operates, it's it's molded by you know 19th century, beginning of 20th century conditions. And now in the modern age, we have a clear gap on on, on how society works and how the democratic system works, and so there is a certain uh, quality of democracy which do we need to work on the, um, domestically. Two final points. First of all, I think we need also discussion exactly, especially between Europe and US. What does it mean, the democracy, especially in the international context? Because I would say that, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago, it was very clearly rules, norms, and international organizations. But do we share the same agenda? What is our agenda? I think we need to have that discussion. And final point, it would be to say that, that very clearly um, it, it's not in order to defend democracy, it's not only about high, you know, hard power. Reina mentioned the cloud, the congressman mentioned that it's not all about, about military aspects. So, so even if it would like to be, Europe and US in this new context are so, not so strong that we are able to just promote democracy through hard power means. We need soft power. And as the former prime minister of Finland, Alexis, uh, Alexander Stubb said, he was speaking about dignified foreign policy values. So two conditions there, more dialogue between Europe and United States. And, and uh, finally, the point was, which was mentioned by many, we need to really walk the talk. We need to be example and be very much aware of our policy actions and decisions we make. So thank you very much. And Reina, back to you. Tommy, thank you so much. You've made very clear at what's at stake and the importance of having an agenda and the potential of wielding soft power uh, that could all help shape the future of democracies. I wanna thank you and very much uh, wanna thank your center uh, for the Martin Center for your help in sponsoring this event. Thank you. Well, today's conversation has really been enlightening with a lot of rich examples of how governments and organizations can safeguard democracy. We all know it's a complex and a very important topic and you'll continue to see more coverage here on FP. Again, a big thanks to the Martin Center for supporting this event today. And we also wanna tell you a little bit about some upcoming events, including on Wednesday, Foreign Policy's Food and Food Summit, which will be held this Wednesday, December 14th. The event brings together global leaders across government, industry, finance, and civil society. There will also be an in-person component in Washington, DC, live streamed on foreignpolicy.events backslash so, sorry, foreignpolicy.com backslash events. If you haven't signed up for their email listing of events, please do. It's a lot of great um, activity and conversations there. So stay tuned there for more uh, on what you can expect in the coming months from our for live foreign policy events team. I wanna thank all of you for joining us. It's been my pleasure to moderate today's conversation.